What's up everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Richard on Data. If you're new here, my name is Richard and this is a channel where we talk about all things data, data science, statistics, and programming. Subscribe for all kinds of content just like this and hit the notification bell so YouTube notifies you whenever I upload a video. So I did a video a little while ago comparing R and Python in the year 2020 and I concluded that while Python is, relatively speaking anyway, the king of the Tyobi index and of data science jobs in 2020, R is still very much alive and well. While Python has been getting more popular and faster, R is still a fundamental part of a lot of different companies' analytics infrastructures, and things like that just simply don't change overnight. That and, when you take a lot of different data science and analytics functionalities, R is still competitive with, or just downright better, than Python is. But a lot of people ask when they start picking up a new language, do I have to memorize this many functions? The short answer is, sort of. So most people know that R is open source and it comes with a ton of different packages that you can install and then load. There are a few packages which you really should know all of the capabilities of because if you don't, you really end up selling yourself short and it can take you way too long to work through some problems that exist in the real world just because you may try and create your own solution from scratch not knowing that the solution to that kind of problem already exists in some package that's out there. But it's not a true exercise in memory because a lot of R packages will come with their own cheat sheets and it's a surprisingly low number of packages which will cover most of the functionalities that a lot of data scientists will have to do from day to day. So I thought it might be helpful to run through 10 of the packages which are going to serve a lot of people the best. Keep in mind, this is not a comprehensive list, and I'm mostly going for general usability over specialization. So just as an example, if you're doing a time series analysis, you'll probably at least want to look at the zoo package, but I'm not including that on here because time series is a fairly specific sort of application. But if you know all 10 of these packages, it'll truly be easy to handle a lot of the problems that real world data will throw at you. And it'll also be easy to pick up new packages and add them to your workflow as needed. Now these are generally in no particular order, but these first five packages are part of the core tidyverse. That means it's super simple just to run install.packages tidyverse followed by library tidyverse, and you are ready to rock and roll with these packages. First and foremost is Deplier. Now this is going to be your go-to for most of your data wrangling and data manipulation needs. Now one of the things that makes Deplier super nice is that it operates with the pipe function. Now this thing looks pretty weird at first, but it's actually awesome. And I think of it like a then statement in English. Basically you're saying, take your data, then select these columns, then filter these rows, just as an example. This is the first page of the Deplier cheat sheet. And now notice there's a lot of different functions in Deplier, but there's only a few absolute core functionalities. So if we start on the right side, you've got the select function, which you can use to select your variables, AKA your features for your data set. Then if we move into the center, you've got filter, which you can use to subset rows based on a condition that you specify. Distinct is another self-explanatory function that I use a little bit. Still, if we look in the center towards the bottom, you've got arrange, which is the equivalent of like a SQL order by statement. Then on the right again, you've got mutate, which creates variables based on other variables. And there's other extensions of that, such as mutate all and mutate at. But then once we end on the left hand side, we've got group by and summarize. Now these are very quick, easy and convenient ways to create detailed summaries or even to create summary stats and then do more wrangling on the new data set that you've created. Now once you've got your data all wrangled into a form that you can at least somewhat work with, number two on the list is going to be ggplot2. And this is going to be your go-to for most things in the data visualization department. I really love this package because it's incredibly flexible. 
And that's because ggplot2 operates through what's called the grammar of graphics framework. And this basically means that any sort of graph can be comprised of at least three separate parts. But above all else, you need number one, data, number two, a coordinate mapping system, and number three, objects, or as ggplot2 likes to call them, geomes. This is just the first of two pages of the ggplot2 cheat sheet, and most of what's going on here is just the different types of visualizations that you can create, and the possibilities are endless. So you've got density plots, histograms, bar charts, scatter plots, line plots, rectangles, pretty much whatever you need. Now if you're not used to the grammar of graphics framework, there can definitely be a bit of a learning curve, and that's why the example in the bottom left is super helpful. Just to walk through this example, it's saying make a plot of the MPG data set, and then under the AES argument, there's the variable highway going to the x-axis, and the variable city going to the y-axis. The geom point add-on tells the function to add points to the graph, so we're basically creating a scatter plot. The color equals CYL argument to it tells ggplot to color the points based on values of the CYL variable. Next, we've got geome smooth, which adds a smooth line that is basically a least squares line. There are the chord Cartesian and scale color gradient parts, which are maybe a little bit redundant because you're basically just specifying the coordinate system and the color scale. But then there's also the theme underscore BW object, which imposes a theme on your ggplot2 graph for design purposes. Then after all that work, here's our graph. Simple, straightforward enough, you've got the highway variable on the x-axis, the city variable on the y-axis, and the points are colored based on the CYL variable. So you've just got a scatter plot with a line of best fit through it. Nothing to it. Now number three on our list is tidy R. Now tidy R exists for exactly one purpose, and that's to get your data into a tidy format. This basically means that every row is an observation, every column is a variable, and every cell in your data has a value in it. Now, tidyr is actually the next iteration of packages like reshape and reshape2, except it's a little bit more stripped down and actually has less functionality. There's really four core functions that I use consistently with tidyr. Starting on the right side, you've got separate and unite. Now these can be used for breaking a variable down into multiple variables or turning multiple variables into one respectively. But then you've got gather and spread in the middle. These have actually been replaced with the newer functions pivot wider and pivot longer. But the idea is you can condense multiple different variables into new rows or vice versa. So if you look at the example under gather, you've got 1999 and 2000 as different columns. But this function makes it easy to turn those into just one variable, which it is, and just call that thing year. This can work wonders for getting your data nice and clean and tidy. Now that your data is hopefully in a nice and clean and tidy format, it's probably time to pass different functions to it. And this brings us to number four, which is per. Is it per or per r? Either way, it's named after the weird vibrating sound that cats make, so it immediately gets points in my book for that. Per r gives you ways to deal with lists and also to map functions to the different elements of a vector or to a list. Now this is sort of like what you would do with a for loop, except it's much easier to read and much faster. Here's the per r cheat sheet. So on the left hand side, we've got map functions, so we can execute a function multiple times to different elements of a list or to a vector. Now the different functions can return lists, data frames, string vectors, numeric vectors, whatever you want. It's very similar to the lapply function and general apply family of functions in base R. But then you've got a ton of super useful functionalities for wrangling with your data when you've got lists. You've got different functionalities for filtering values, creating summaries, restructuring the data, all kinds of great stuff. Number five on the list is gonna be string R. And string R is gonna be your go-to for your string and your text and your regular expression needs. 
Now, string R does have a lot of functionalities that also exist in base R, but they're a lot more user-friendly and just frankly easier to remember in string R than they are in base R. So string R is fairly straightforward because most all of its functions begin with the prefix str. But you've got a fairly comprehensive toolkit here. You can detect patterns, you can create substrings and easily turn those into new features. You've got tools for replacing patterns and predefined substrings. This whole package will be at its most useful when you have a data frame that's in tidy form where several of your features are of character type. Number six on this list is the first one that's not going to be part of the core tidyverse, and that's going to be Luberdate. And Luberdate, on top of having an overall awesome name, is going to be your go-to for dealing with your problems involving date or date time, aka POSIX CT variables. Let's face it, date times in R can be a giant pain to deal with sometimes, and they can have a bit of a learning curve with them. When you work with them with Luberdate, it's usually a breeze. Right up front, you've got the asDateTime function, which is basically a wrapper for turning what looks like a date time into a character string and then into a POSIX CT, which is the main date time class that you work with in R. But then your core functions are in the middle here, with extracting things like the date, the year, the month parts, etc. Very helpful stuff. And naturally, you can both extract and manipulate your data using these functions. And there's also a ton of other functions on the second page for adding increments of time as well as handling durations. Super handy package. Luberdate is definitely one to have in your repertoire. Number seven on this list is a package which is transparent and reflects light. And I'm talking, of course, about Shiny. Shiny is one of the most powerful and overall awesome packages in the entire R ecosystem. What it is is it's a tool for creating interactive web applications that end users can play with. And in my opinion anyway, it truly blows anything that you can do in Python out of the water. Let's start on the left hand side here. A Shiny app will consist of two distinct components, a UI and a server. You can build them in the same file, but I like organizing myself by keeping them separate. Now the UI is your front end, or a web page, which will have inputs which are configured by the end user. Then the server is your back end, so basically your computer that's running a live R session. On the right side of this cheat sheet, you've got some examples of the different inputs. The end user can play with those in the UI, and those inputs get fed to different output objects inside of your server. Some examples are action buttons or checkboxes, which can be used to configure various things, but then also dates, files, numbers, text inputs, you name it. Then if you look down the middle, those outputs could be data tables, regular tables, text strings, plots, other UIs, which is a super powerful feature in and of itself. And it takes a long time, I think, to get the handle of Shiny and of reactive elements in general, but it's truly a remarkable framework and the power of it will amaze you and probably your clients too. Number eight is R Markdown. And with this, you're getting the functionalities of a ton of different packages, all with the end goal of creating usable, easy to read documents and notebooks. R Markdown is incredible, and I really think the integration that it has with the R Studio IDE makes it easier to use and more powerful than Jupyter Notebooks. And trust me, I have nothing but love for Jupyter Notebooks. Here's the first page of an R Markdown cheat sheet. And the long and the short of R Markdown is it takes a lot of HTML and CSS and stuff that data scientists typically don't know very well, I know I certainly don't, and just doing all of that for you so you can quickly and easily create reports. And this page of the cheat sheet basically walks you through a lot of the steps and syntax for creating an R Markdown file. You've got a step for creating a document, which you can then knit to turn into a doc or a PDF. Your R code is gonna come inside various code chunks and this is a super helpful tool for your workflow if you have to code but also constantly share your results with others because it just keeps everything in one place plus there's also features for incorporating shiny input into the R markdown as well so you can create interactive documents moving on to number nine we've got carrot 
Now, Carrot and Shiny basically compete day to day for the distinction of my favorite R package of all time. Which one of these two I like more sort of depends on what mood I'm in more than anything. Carrot is a front to back tool for all of your machine learning needs. Now I will point out there's another package called Tidy Models, which compiles a bunch of smaller machine learning packages into a tidy framework. But in the year 2020, I do think Carrot is still a bit more mature. Future development is probably going into tidy models rather than Carrot, but the same guy, Max Kuhn, works on both of them, and in the year 2020, I have to say I do still prefer Carrot. Here's your Carrot cheat sheet. Now let's actually start down the middle column. So Carrot makes pre-processing your data for all of your machine learning needs super easy. You can even start by partitioning your data into test and training sets, which isn't listed here, but you've got normalizing your predictors, transforming them, filtering, imputing missing data, what have you. Then you can select how your model gets trained and summarized using the train control function. Starting with your resampling options, you can pick between your usual cross-validation, bootstrap, out-of-bag resampling, etc. Now you can also do subsampling methods like upsampling or downsampling in those times where you're working in classification problems where you have imbalanced classes. You have summary functions like the two-class summary for an ROC curve, PR summary for precision recall info, etc. Then last but not least, you have the train function. Function. So you pick the machine learning method you want, and believe me, you have tons of options here. You can pick how many values per tuning parameter you want the method to evaluate, and then bam, you've got yourself a very easily trained machine learning model that you can then use for prediction purposes. Last but not least, we've got reticulate. And I'm putting this one on the list because I'm a firm believer in treating the two languages as R and Python rather than R versus Python. There's no need to treat it as a competition all the time because these two languages really do have the ability to complement one another very nicely. Also, let's just be real, writing Python code from the R Studio IDE is just awesome. So my favorite way to do this is to write the Python code from inside an R markdown document. Then it's super simple. Inside the code chunk, you specify R or Python, then you're ready to rock and roll. You can import the Python modules that you want and use your usual dollar sign operator to extract the attributes the way you typically would in a Python workflow. But then you've got super convenient and easy mapping between R objects and Python objects. You can do this manually too, but Reticulate gives you the awesome pi to R and R to pi functions. So these are 10 packages in R which I really recommend any data scientist to learn. And I hope you do realize that while there's a lot to learn in the data science world, there's a little bit of a Pareto principle at work here with R packages. I listed off way less than 20% of all of the packages in the R ecosystem, but still, if you master these packages, you're going to be able to do a huge number of things that you would need to do in the data science universe. And yes, there will always be a learning curve, but me personally, I find learning 10 things a lot more manageable than learning 50 or 100 things. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it and you'd like to support my work, the most helpful thing you could do for me would be to share this video. Otherwise, please consider at least smashing the like button. And then I'll see you all in the not so distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.